In this presentation, we'll take a look at some things from Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14, and John 13. As always, I encourage you to read these chapters before you listen, that you may get more out of it, as I won't go into a lot of the detail of the storyline, but just give insights and commentary. First of all, let's start out with Matthew 26, verses 7 through 13. This is the story where a woman comes in and anoints Jesus with oil. As she is doing that, some of the disciples are concerned of what she's doing, why she is doing this. Couldn't this oil have been used for better purposes, uh, selling it, helping the poor, etc.? And there's just two questions that you may want to ponder and think about concerning this story. And one of them actually comes from Jesus. And he says, why trouble this woman? Why do they trouble the woman? Why is it that they want to stop her and do something else with the oil? And number two, what does she understand that they do not? It's obviously that she has some greater understanding concerning Christ and his death and his burial, because Christ says she's doing this in preparation of my burial. And so she obviously has a greater understanding of certain things than some of the disciples as they were witnessing it. And this makes me think it appears that we will regard the Savior in direct correlation to what we know about him. My knowledge and witness of the Savior will affect how I think about him and his application or importance in my life. Obviously, this woman had a greater understanding and therefore was performing this act in preparation of his burial. Well, what is my understanding of the Savior? And does it have a reflection or will it reflect on how I treat him, what I think of him, and how much I want to follow him? Next, let's turn to Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. The Savior makes an interesting statement as he is, institutes the sacrament for the first time. And he makes a statement about a future sacrament meeting that will be held upon the earth. Verse 29 says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so the Savior is prophesying that one day he's going to come back and drink or partake of the sacrament again with his disciples upon the earth. The type that is symbolic of this meeting that will be held is found in Doctrine and Covenants, section 107, verses 53 through 57, which says, Three years previous to the death of Adam, he called Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalil, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah, who were all high priests, with the residue of his prosperity, posterity who were righteous into the valley of Adam on Diamond, and there bestowed upon them his last blessings. And the Lord appeared to them, and they rose up and blessed Adam and called him Michael, the prince, the archangel. And the Lord ministered comfort unto Adam and said unto him, I have set thee to be at the head. A multitude of nations shall come of thee, and thou art a prince over them forever. And Adam stood up in the midst of the congregation, and notwithstanding he was bowed down with age, being full of the Holy Ghost, predicted whatsoever should befall his posterity unto the latest generation. And so it tells us that three years previous to the death of Adam, there is a meeting held in Adam on Diamond, where Christ comes in that meeting. And keys and blessings are bestowed upon Adam. Well, that's a type, meaning 
that will be repeated in the latter days. So let's take here is the prophecy that this will happen again, where Christ, Adam, and his righteous pos posterity will meet again. The prophecy is found in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, which says, I, referring to Daniel, saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, meaning Christ. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So Daniel prophesies where he sees again Adam and his posterity gathering together and the Son of Man coming down and where he will be given kingdom and glory and his dominion and his righteous reign here upon this earth. Well, what is the latter-day place of this great meeting that's going to be held? Is found in Doctrine and Covenants, section 116. It says, Spring Hill, and this is that's in Missouri, is named by the Lord Adam on Diamond, because, said he, it is the place Adam shall come to visit his people, or the Ancient of Days shall sit, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So someday in the future there will be held a meeting at Spring Hill, or what we call Adam Diamond, in the state of Missouri. And there Christ will come, and all of the prophets will give an account of their stewardship to Christ. And then he will be declared and made King of Kings and Lord of Lords over us and ruler of this great nation. Concerning this future sacrament meeting with the Savior, will he says, I will drink anew with you the fruit of this vine. I will partake of the sacrament. President Joseph Fielding Smith said the following, This council in the Valley of Adam and Diamon is to be the greatest importance to this world. At that time, there will be a few transfer of authority from the usurper and imposter Lucifer to the rightful King Jesus Christ. Judgment will be set, and all who have held keys will make their reports and deliver their stewardships as they shall be required. Adam will direct this judgment, and then he will make his report as the one holding the keys for this earth to his superior officer, Jesus Christ. Our Lord will then assume the reins of government, directions will be given to the priesthood, and he whose right it is to rule will be installed officially by the voice of the priesthood there assembled. This grand council of priesthood will be composed not only of those who are faithful, who now dwell on this earth, but also of the prophets and apostles of old who have had directing authority. Others may also be there. If so, they will be there by appointment. For it, this it is to be an official council called to attend to the most momentous matters concerning the destiny of this earth. When this gathering is held, the world will not know of it. The, membership, the members of the church at large will not know of it. Yet it shall be preparatory to the coming in the clouds of glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, as the prophet Joseph Smith has said. The world cannot know of it, the saints cannot know of it, except those who officially shall be called into this council. For it shall precede the coming of Jesus Christ as a thief in the night, unbeknown to the world. So there's some insights into this meeting, what it will consist of, some of the events that will take place there, reporting on the keys that they have held, and officially sustaining and making Christ the reign and ruler of this earth. And then those who are officially appointed to be there will be there, not just of those in the past, but also those of the present. What a great thing. And this will happen before what we call Christ's coming in the second coming. This is a great event for the righteous. Matthew 26, 30 
says this concerning Christ. After they have had the Last Supper, the Passover, and as he has instituted the sacrament, Matthew 26, 30 says, Out of all the things the Savior could have done right before he enters the Garden of Gethsemane, he accom to accomplish the great atonement, he sings a hymn. Before he enters the Garden of Gethsemane, to suffer more than anyone has ever or will ever suffer, so much that it even makes him, God, tremble and shake because of the pain. And what does he do to prepare for that? He sings a hymn with his apostles. I think, brothers and sisters, that gives us an insight to the power of music, of what it can be in our life, for good or for evil. We need to be careful of what kind of music we let guide us. Uh, influence us here on earth the savior in preparing for the greatest event in all of mankind sings a hymn and that reminds me of doctrine and covenants 25 12 for my soul delighteth in the song of the heart yea the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads and so that gives us insight to probably why the savior sings a hymn as he's offering up prayers of help and gratitude to his Father as he sings in him. Matthew 26, 33-34 is the story that's well known about Peter, where Christ prophesies and tells Peter that thrice he shall deny him before the cock crows or before morning comes. Much has been said concerning this story, much has been said concerning Peter, and why would he do that? Um, I would like to give you a different take upon this, and it is this. Is it possible that when the Savior told Peter that he would deny him three times, that the Savior was not just making a statement of future acts, but, the sa but that the Savior was giving a command? In other words, is it possible that he's saying, Peter, thou shalt deny me three times, meaning I command you to deny me so that you too are not taken and killed. Is this a command to give to Peter instead of just a prophesying of a future event that is going to happen? I think that that's possibly what the Savior is saying and makes more sense. On July 13, 1971, President Spencer W. Kimball gave a talk at BYU titled, Peter, My Brother, where he suggests or opens the possibility that might, that might be what the Savior is saying. To keep Peter alive, he was to deny knowing the Savior. Maybe the Savior knows that if he stands up against this trial that Savior is going through, that who knows, but that the Romans will take and kill him too, and any other of the twelve that stand up. But he needs them. He needs them to guide and direct the church. Peter had declared that he would go to his death defending the Savior. And in the book of John, Peter is the one who cuts off the ear of the servant in trying to defend the Savior when the guards come for the Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark 14, 31, Peter declares that he is willing to die with the Savior. And so we have evidence that Peter is not a coward, but he is willing to step forward and try to defend the Savior not completely understanding the events that are going to happen and the atonement and the crucifixion, the suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter is willing to take a stand and die for him. And the Savior does not need that. He needs Peter to be alive along with the other apostles so that they can guide and direct the church when he is not here upon this earth. So here are some excerpts from this talk that Spencer, President Spencer W. Kimball gives called Peter, 
my brethren. He makes some interesting statements concerning Peter and why he may have denied him and did what he did. And he suggests that this thou shalt deny me thrice is more of a command to Peter than just stating some some future acts that Peter is going to commit. So here's from Peter, my brother. Remember that Peter never denied the divinity of Christ. He only denied his association or acquaintance with Christ, which is quite a different matter. Could it have been confusion and frustration that caused Peter's denial? Could there still have been some lack of understanding considering the total unfolding of the plan. Being a leader, Peter was a special target of the adversary. As the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Simon, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Peter was under fire. All the hosts of hell were against him. The die had been cast for the Savior's crucifixion. If Satan could destroy Simon now, what a victory he would score. Here was the greatest of all of you men. Lucifer wanted to confuse him, frustrate him, limit his prestige, and totally destroy him. However, this is not to be, for he was chosen for and anointed to a higher purpose in heaven, as was Abraham. Peter followed the Savior to his trial and sat in the outer court. What else could he do? He knew that many times the Savior himself had escaped from the crowd by slipping out of their clutches. Would he again do so? Though the Lord taught of the coming crucifixion and resurrection, neither Simon nor anyone else fully comprehended his meaning. Was this so strange? Never before had there been such a person or such an occurrence on the earth. Millions today cannot understand the resurrection, even though it has been preached for 1900 years as a reality with many infallible proofs. Could these men then be criticized for not fully understanding this frustrating situation? Is it possible that there might have been some other reason for Peter's triple denial. Could he have felt that the circumstances justified expediency? Meaning, does Peter maybe get an inkling that this is the way it's supposed to go? This is the way it's supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to do so that I stay alive. Again, President Kimball, could he have felt that circumstances justified expediency? When he bore a strong testimony in Caesarea Philippi, he had been told that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. When the three apostles came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, they were again charged implicitly, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man is risen again from the dead. Could Peter have felt this was not the time to tell of Christ? He has been with the Lord in Nazareth when the Savior was taken by his own people to the brow of the hill, whereupon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Surely Peter did not think of this escape as cowardice, but as wise expediency. Christ's time was not come. When the Lord had spent some energy in attempting to explain the coming crisis, how he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again on the third day, Peter attempted to dissuade the Savior from thinking of such calamity. See Matthew 16, 21. He was promptly chastised for suggesting escape from the tragedy. Perhaps he should have understood that it was the Lord's will that the dire happenings occur. See, you see what President Kimball is suggesting? He's opened the possibility of the door that slowly and literally Peter is getting the insight that this is what is supposed to happen. 
He has been told not to declare Christ as the Christ yet. Christ clearly said that when he bore testimony of him, that it's not the time. And so there's this idea that Peter is denying him three times because this is what he is supposed to do. Continuing President Kimball, what this meant that the hour was now come, Peter may not have fully realized, but he was prohibited from resisting the coming crucifixion by the Redeemer himself. Was he frustrated? Perhaps for the moment. But how many of us in a hostile camp, totally helpless to save, would champion the Lord under such circumstances, especially when previous efforts had been repulsed? Had not Peter single-handedly already raised his sword against a great multitude with swords and staves? Had he not attempted to defend the Lord from all the mob's manhandling and kidnapping, and was he not stopped by the Lord? The Savior had walked calmly from Gethsemane's garden, seemingly resigned to the inevitable sacrifice of himself. Simon had courageously manifested his willingness to alone fight the great mob to protect his master. At the risk of death, he had struck the contemptible Malthus and slifed off his ear. But this act of bravery and personal disregard was stopped by the Lord who said to his loyal apostle, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? What more could Peter do? How else could he show his loyalty and courage? Could it be that in the last hours Peter realized that he should should stop protecting his Lord, that the crucifixion was inevitable, and that regardless of all his acts, the Lord was moving towards his destiny. I do not know. I only know that this apostle was brave and fearless. That's some interesting insights that President Kimball, one apostle, is sharing about another apostle that maybe we should not be too harsh on Peter for denying the Savior thrice, perhaps as President Kimball is suggesting that this was a command, that his crucifixion was inevitable. There was a part of the plan. Peter, I do not need you to save me from this, and I need you alive. And to that end, deny knowing and being acquaintance with me. The three times that is going to happen so that thou will be spared to be the great apostle and prophet of that dispensation. In Matthew 26, 39, we know that as Christ goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, he pleads with his Father and says, If it be possible, let this cup pass from before me. Or is there another way, Father? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Again, quoting from President Kimball, he gives some interesting insights concerning the Savior and his desires and what this must have been like for him. That the Savior, if at all possible, wanted to stay alive. President Kimball says, Christ wanted to avoid martyrdom if possible. Jesus Christ was the very Son of God, the Eternal Father, and as such had supernatural powers not possessed by us, his holy mortal brothers and sisters on the earth. It was within his power to die or to continue to live. Most people, given that choice, would continue to live. But a great principle was at stake. It was a monumental choice to make. He loved life. He wanted to live. He had his sweet mother, his brothers and sisters and friends. His work had been prospering. Thousands had heard his message gladly and accepted his gospel. His church was young, but showed signs of growth and permanence. Preeminence. That he wanted very much to live is evidenced by his record recorded prayer to his father, when in Gethsemane he cried out in agony of his soul, O oh, my father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. 
The cup assigned to him to drain was his death by martyrdom for the sins of the world. It would seem that the Savior would be most happy if it had been possible for an atonement for the people to have been affected in some other way so that he could have lived on in peace and joy. Having received no favorable reply to his pleading, he cried again and again, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. I, I think sometimes I just think all these things were just automatically. The Savior just automatically went in the garden. He just, you know, it just happened. And this gives an insight to the real cost that the Savior loved his family. He wanted to be with his family and friends. He wanted to live. He didn't want to leave them, if at all it was possible. That he loved life and he loved his family. And so we see the pleading of the Savior in a new light, that if possible, could I please stay on the earth, especially with this fledgling church, and help it to grow. But realizing that that was probably not a possibility, he is willing to say, nevertheless, let thy will be done. In Mark chapter 14, verses 35 through 36, we see how intimate this pleading is. Mark gives this insight. He and he, Christ, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. The word Abba is a very intimate, personal word that he gives for his father. It is the same of our Papa or Daddy. You can just see him pleading as he's feeling the pressure and the weight of not just the world, but of universes upon his shoulder to atone for the sins and the fallen nature of mankind. And what word does he use to cry out to his father? Daddy, Daddy, please, if it be possible. And so we see this beautiful, intimate relationship of a son pleading to his dad. Matthew 26, 63 through 65 is another time Jesus says, nevertheless, that will cost him his life. Prior to the Garden of Gethsemane, or actually I believe after, as he is being um, questioned by the chief priests and the elders, it says this, starting in verse 63 of Matthew 26, but Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou shalt tell us whether thou be Christ, the Son of God. Now you need to understand their traditions and what they believe. The Jewish people, leaders believed that being the Messiah, the Christ, could be a different person than being the Son of God, that they were two separate people. Not one as Christ is claiming. So we adjure thee, art thou the Messiah and the Son of God? Or art thou just being the Messiah? If he declared to be just the Messiah, then they had no grounds upon which to accuse him of anything and therefore no penalty to, to take him and have him killed. But if he claimed to be the Son of God, see, that would be blasphemous if you weren't which they thought he was not, then that would be grounds of blasphemy. And the penalty for blasphemy is death. And so now they're asking him. And so he answers, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Thou hast said, I am the Christ, the Son of God. Thou hast said, Yes, I am the Messiah. 
But he says, nevertheless, he could have stopped right there. And then they would not have had any evidence or any reason to condemn him. And then they couldn't have taken him before Pilate and had him crucified. But he says, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Or in other words, yes, I am the Messiah. But nevertheless, I am also God's Son who sits on his right hand and who one day will come in power and great glory. And so he declares his divine sonship as the Son of God. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, What has he has spoken blasphemy? What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. Like I said, it's only blasphemy if he wasn't the Son of God. But since they didn't believe him, they now say, Oh, now we have evidence to accuse him of blasphemy, which now includes the death penalty. Once again, Christ says, Nevertheless, which will cost him his life. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17 is the story and the episode of Christ now washing the feet of the apostles. Ella Bruce R. McConkie writes concerning this event some important and insightful things that we will now consider. Elder McConkie says concerning this event, And so John says, supper being ended, or rather during supper, the devil, having now put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, these words read like a formal indictment. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he raised us from supper and laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. This appears to be a general summary of all that transpired. What then follows are some of the particulars. As to those particulars, John says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus replied, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. That is, you assume that I am acting only as any slave or host might, which is far from the case. I am about to perform a sacred ordinance, the meaning of which I will explain, and in due course you will know its true meaning. Still impulsive and reticent, the chief apostle said, Thou art our master and Lord, thou of all people, needest not to wash my feet, even though it be a sacred ordinance, let someone else, someone else do it instead. If we judge aright, Peter was the first one to have his feet washed, as he should have been, he being the senior apostle and the future president of the church. John's phrase, then cometh he to Simon Peter, means not that he came to him after the others, but either that he came to him from across the table or from the place where the basin and water for purification had stood. It would have been quite inappropriate, a self-serving assertion of excessive humility on his part, if Peter had first seen Jesus wash the feet of others and had then objected to the performance of the same act on his behalf. Since it was common for slaves and servants to wash the feet of guests, Peter's objection was to the Lord of heaven as though he were merely a slave washing the feet of one who was one worthy as he deemed himself to be. After hearing the conversation with Peter, and learning somewhat the meaning and the importance of the ordinance, none of the others would have objected. What had he done? Had he, he had instituted, nay, reinstituted, for the order of the house of God has been and ever will be the same, he had reinstituted one of the holy ordinances of the everlasting gospel. 
Those who have been washed in the waters of baptism, who have been freed from sin and evil through the waters of regeneration, who have come forth thereby in a newness of life, and who then press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, keeping the commandments and walking in paths and truths and righteousness, qualified to have an eternal seal placed on their godly conduct. They are thus ready to be endowed with power from on high. Then, in holy places, they cleanse their hands and their feet, as the scripture saith, and become clean from the blood of this wicked generation. That's Dr. Clements 88, 74, 75, 137 through 41. Then, as the scriptures also saith, they receive anointings and washings and conversations and statutes and judgments. DNC 124, 37 through 40. Then they receive what Jesus here gave the twelve, for as the prophet said, the house of the Lord must be prepared, and in it we must attend to the ordinance of washing of feet. It was never intended for any but official members. It is calculated to unite our hearts that we may be one in feeling and sentiment, and that our faith may be strong so that Satan cannot over throw us, nor have any power over us here. That's from his commentary on the New Testament, Brother McConkie. Did the twelve then know what Jesus had done in their behalf? Perhaps in part, with the full significance to come to them hereafter, receiving that Pentecostal endowment from on high, which is the Holy Ghost. No doubt also Jesus then said more to them than John chose to record, for many things relative to these holy things are too sacred to publish to the world. It should be clear to all, however, that just as the act of immersion in water only hints at the true significance and power of baptism, so the act of the washing of feet is far more than the cleansing and refreshing of dusty and tired pedal extremities. It is an eternal ordinance with internal import, understood only by enlightened saints. All of this is from his Mortal Messiah series. And then in Mormon doctrine, he says, it should be remembered that the endowment given in Kirtland Temple was only a partial endowment, and that the full endowment was not performed until the saints had established themselves in Nauvoo. The full endowment, referred to in the Revelation, dated January 19th, 1841, which is Doctrine and Covenants 124, 36 to 31, including washings and anointings, except under unusual circumstances, is to be administered in the temples of the Lord. Thus the knowledge relative to the washing of feet has been revealed step by step in this day until the full knowledge is now incorporated in the ordinances of the Lord's house, the temple. Back to Brother McConkie. Obviously, the apostate peoples of the world, being without revelation to guide them, cannot comply with our Lord's command given on the occasion of the Last Supper. Because of the ordinances of the temple, washing and anointings, and the endowment, we, better under, we understand better what Christ is performing and what he is trying to teach by the washing of the feet of the apostles. This is sacred ground and is only taught in sacred places called temples or discussed there. So as you go and participate in the ordinance of washing and anointings, think about what Christ is trying to teach Peter. What is he trying to teach us the temple through the symbolism of what is being said in that ordinance? Thank goodness for modern revelation and the restoration of the gospel. Uh, we can better understand the scriptures and the events that Christ participated in with his apostles. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.